the University of Johannesburg, a future reimagined. All right, I think we should uh, start. Uh, colleagues, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to this uh, other session of uh, Future Professors, uh, the second phase, in, uh, talking today about the NRF rating one more time with a, another side of the experience. Uh, it's great to welcome you all. My name is Andrew Kaniki. I've been given the opportunity to facilitate this and I'm delighted to welcome my good old friend, uh, Fedi van der Voort. Uh, Fedi uh, comes with us with a long experience in the, uh, the, you know, the National Research Foundation functioning. Um, he, after 20 years of uh, experience in the pharmaceutical industry, joined the then Foundation for Research and Development, which is a forerunner to the NRF. Uh, you joined the NRF and or FRD then to establish the science liaison uh, office, which he then worked with uh, different science councils and the departments, uh, government departments, uh, to work on the coherence of science policies and implementation of science policies. Um, after leaving the National Research Foundation in 2001, Fedi has been providing consultancies and services uh, in research and research management across the, the science system. And of course, for the NRF, for many of us who worked for the NRF, he was a dependable and has always been a dependable chair of, uh, of panels, both in terms of uh, research uh, support uh, proposals, uh, research development area, uh, and uh, most recently chaired the panel that looked at the review of uh, the Centers of Excellence and, and Sachi. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, uh, Fedi, who does a lot of, as I said, consultancies, even on the, uh, uh, you know, on uh, uh, research and, and of course uh, on a rating of the NRF. So Fedi's uh, focus today is to look at uh, other side of uh, you know, some of the pitfalls of applications in the rating and uh, his own experiences in that. So we will give him an opportunity to make a presentation as usual, uh, and then we'll have uh, an opportunity to have a conversation. If there is a, an agent question that somebody may have uh, while he's presenting, there's no problem. You can uh, raise your hand uh, or just jump in and just ask, but I would prefer that we give him an opportunity to make the presentation, and then we engage in a conversation. You can, of course, continue uh, sending through, uh, you know, the chat, and if there are questions and comments that you have, that would be appreciated. Fedi, over to you. I'm starting from the other side of the NRF, and that is looking at the requirements, the processes, and more importantly, the pitfalls. Uh, so where do we begin? Okay, where to start? Some of this I'm recapping, um, and I think there's a reason for this. Uh, so it's just trying to get into a rhythm where we're looking at what is an NRF rating, who can apply, why should you apply, the NRF rating categories, and then the process of applying. And that I think is where we'll spend quite a bit of time. So the first thing, <clears throat> where, to start, where to start, the guidelines and instructions for applicants in completing a rating application, beginning of this year, the NRF um, gave out, or this was made available on their website, the seven steps for the call for 2022. And the cutoff date was obviously for 28 February 2021, um, so, sorry, 2022. The reason I'm using this, um, the guidelines and instructions, is because the latest ones have not yet been published. And there are certain assumptions we will have to make uh, that with the new connect system 
moving away from the NRF online system, that there won't be that many changes. There will be changes in the connect system, but not in the information required. So I've tried to get information from the NRF on what changes have taken place. And I was just told, um, we're still busy working on the system. Um, and as soon as it becomes available, we will make it known. So the only thing we can do is work on the basis from that online system worked for close on 15 years, 20 years, and the information was developed over the, uh, in the information required was developed over this period of time. And I don't think it's going to deviate too much from what is required for rating and the information required for rating. Um, so it's not going to be a drastic change, but the change is going to be in the NRF Connect system. So what is an NRF rating based upon? It's an assessment of your recent track record on the quality and impact of your research outputs. And it's a relative standing and recognition by your peers based on the above. We always talk about it's an NRF rating. NRF is the facilitator. It is a guardian of the rating system, but the rating is done by your peers based on peer review system. And that peer review is done internationally. Then we come to the scientometrics and bibliometrics and the H index. Like some people call it the dreaded H index. This is used as supportive information. It is not the end all and be all. In some faculties or some disciplines, you will find that the H index of within that discipline tends to be very low. And the reason for that is in education and in law, when people are publishing on the local and national issues, that will not be picked up on the international databases. And therefore, those H, although you may be cited, it is not picked up internationally. And for that reason, you will find that in certain fields, the H index tends to be very low. In others, it's much higher. And it's the main thing is this is based on international peer review. Now, <clears throat> the peer review is based again on a review response template, which looks at the confidentiality agreement that has got to be signed, the conflict of interest, the background knowledge of the applicant's research field, and then they have to appraise the quality and impact of the research outputs in the last eight years. And for the current call, it will be from 1 January 2015 to 31 December 2022. And it's an estimation of the applicant's current standing as a researcher as benchmark against global peers. And <clears throat> very important is the feedback given to the applicants. And the reviewers recommendations for future development of research, they <clears throat> raise certain points which the uh, reviewers say you may wish to uh, consider. Uh, quite often it is, you can publish less, but publish in higher impact journals. And they make some very good recommendations because this is looking at the future. Then we'll look at the definition of NRF rating categories. And then there are guidelines for the members of the assessment panels given to the um, reviewers. So for the evaluation and rating app application types, there are the new applicant applications. These are researchers who have never applied for rating in the past. There is re-evaluation by invitation. Those are research who are currently rated, will be invited by the NRF to submit documents for re-evaluation. And then there is re-evaluation for researchers that have chosen not 
to respond to the above invitation and whose ratings have therefore lapsed or researchers whose application for rating was unsuccessful for uh, three or more years ago. Who can apply for rating? Um, well, it's basically people, uh, researchers affiliated with the NRF Recognized Research Institute uh, who are permanently employed researchers or academics. They may have a fixed term contract. They may be dual appointees, both local and at local and international institutions. And then retired academics, honorary appointees, research associates and fellows, as well as researchers that still will be appointed. They can apply, and this happens when you've got researchers abroad who've applied for a position and they're now getting everything into place to come to the new institution, but they wish to apply for rating prior to um, getting here. So there are the three types of applicants, the new, re-evaluation by invitation and re-evaluation as lapsed. The NRF rating system, I think you've, you've gone through this before, but it's worth looking at it again. It's, it's the key driver in the NRF's aim to build a globally competitive science system in South Africa. And to me, it is important that it is a tool for benchmarking the quality of our researchers against the best in the world. And the NRF ratings are allocated based on a researcher's recent research outputs and impact as perceived by international peer reviewers. And the rating system encourages researchers to publish high quality outputs in high impact journals. And the rating is based primarily on the quality and impact of the research. And you will find some of these phrases coming through over and over, and that is the quality and the impact. And <clears throat> according to this, you will get a rating. So what are, who should apply for rating? Again, it's a benchmarking exercise. Emerging researchers, it is part of your career planning. The use of rating for promotion and recruitment is being, it's being used more and more. It was never really intended for that purpose, but it has morphed into one of the um, requirements. For established researchers, it is maintaining and improving your levels of research excellence, so you are benchmarking yourself. And one of the most important things that I think people don't often realize is that it is a reflection on the research of the past eight years. You've got now time to reflect on what you've been doing for the past eight years and not just running on a treadmill. You now need to look back and say, this is what I'm busy with. This is time to reflect, am I going forward with the same work that I've been doing for the past eight years or 10 years or 20 years? Or is it time that there was something during this period that gave me an opportunity to move into a new direction? And this, by reflecting on what you have done and getting feedback, I think that is an important part of this whole rating exercise. And then the other, example that I often use is that it attracts postgraduate students. You can now say to your, uh, your students, I'm a rated researcher, therefore I'm an established researcher recognized by my peers as being somebody who <clears throat> has established himself within this uh, niche area. So if we now look at the rating categories, I'm just going to quickly go through these. 
emerging researchers, there's a Y and a P category in the established researchers, the C, the B with the established research with considerable international recognition, and then the A's, the leading international scholars. Where do you fit in? <clears throat> For a Y category, you must have had a doctorate obtained no more than five years ago and must be 40 years or younger. For the P category, must have a doctorate obtained no more than five years ago and must be 35 years of age or younger at closing date. And then additional information, um, the equivalent of for the YMP categories, if you, sorry, if you have completed your PhD in 2017 or later, you will, uh, you will need to apply under the 2023 call, which is the one coming up in order to be considered for a Y rating or for a P category. P criteria for the emerging researchers. Because you do not have eight years experience as a, if I can call them post doctoral uh, experience, you need to show that you've got the potential to become an established researcher within five years and you've only got five years of history so it makes the work that you need to do at the postdoctoral level um, very important and previously postdoctoral fellows were not allowed to apply or could not apply but they now do qualify to apply but there are certain conditions um, that go along with the application. And then it, during this period, you need to ensure that your outputs are published in a variety of good journals. It cannot just be one or two journals. It should be a, a variety, both national and international journals, and preferably showing that you have started publishing at an international level at, um, in journals with a high impact factor. And publications in journals that do not have a high impact factor, they do not enhance your CV. So be aware of this. And then a caveat, do not apply too early. I know it's people want to get their rating um, and they very keen and they publish, but please be aware that you should not try and apply too early. What are the next steps? Update your CV on the NRF Connect system. Now the NRF Connect system, I don't know if people have gone into it. Um, originally when it was launched, um, with the Tuka program, as I almost want to call it a, a, an experiment, because there were a lot of glitches. I have not been on the system recently, but when I reviewed some of the applications, I did find other glitches, and I made the NRF aware of this. So one of the things you need to do is please keep your CV updated and you need to update your CV before you open the application. Then <clears throat> there's a distinguishing, there's a distinct difference between an academic CV and the NRF CV. And that is why I, when I've requested people to send me their CVs, I've asked them to send me their academic CVs. And there's a very good reason for this. From the academic CV, one can they then advise um, that there may be things that are missing, there, there are things that you've left out, or there are things that are unclear. And I have come across people who forgot that they were a Fulbright scholar or for Numbolt Fellow. And how you can forget that you were one of those, I don't know. But I picked it up in the academic CV, but they had not included it in the NRF CV under the personal profile. 
And that is why it is important to look at this as in keeping it updated. And as it, you update it, there may be f some of the work with um, so, some of the activities that you mentioned earlier that are no longer relevant. And then you can start deleting and uh, you keep it within that five to eight year period of requirement. With conference presentations, um, try to be selective and do not try and include all your conferences that you have attended where you've got a student uh, or five students who attended the same conference and presented their papers or posters and it they just appears five your name appears five times but in fact it is becoming too much information you are clouding the space with irrelevant information. So just be careful on that. If we look at the current NRFCV online system, I've highlighted one or two things. The research expertise. Again, please be selective and limit the number of fields of specialization. You may have experience or training in a number of these fields, but are you truly a, are you truly a specialist in that field? Ask yourself that question. Try to avoid your research interests and concentrate on your future field of specialization. Because this is what your NRF rating would be based upon because they like to see this continued and sustained engagement with your field of specialization. And by spreading your interests too wide, you are also diverting attention away from your focus, which is in turn does not give support for the project you wish to submit for funding, or in this case, for your rating application. So if you've got too many things, a lot of those things that you say that you, um, you that are part of your research expertise, are in fact only tools that you are using for your work. So again, just be selective. If we then, <clears throat> just to digress for a minute, we were talking about publications and being selective. Now this was written 10 years ago and I think it is still very valid that the goal of scientific research is publication. And that's the scientific experiment, no matter how spectacular the results, is not complete until the results are published. While you are busy planning your publications, if it's good enough to be funded, it should be good enough to publish. If you get funding, whether it's from the university, from the UCDP program, a Tutuka program, or from industry. If it's good enough, if you convince them that this they should fund it, then it should be good enough to publish. And then you've got to decide who are the authors? Is it going to be a single author, multiple author? Which journal are you going to pu pu publish in? And unfortunately, the institutional pressure is high on <clears throat> academics that they must publish they are given certain key objectives and quite often they <clears throat> go for low impact journals and the, <laughs> the answer when you ask them why it's well it's a DHET accredited journal and that's good enough if it's good enough for them I get my subsidy and that's what I'm working for um, and that is where things start going wrong. You should be looking at the quantity versus quality and the quantity does not count. It is the quality that counts. So please be aware of this. Now, <clears throat> the personal profile 
this is where I said there's a, a NRF CV and your academic CV. The personal profile in the NRF CV allows you to provide information which is no not in, in your normal NRF CV. In the normal NRF CV, CV, they ask you about your qualifications, your career, and they go through <clears throat> number of publications or where you've published, the conferences, um, keynote addresses, patents, etc. But there's a lot of things that that they do not ask. So in short, the introduction must be written as a narrative in the first person. And <clears throat> again, you notice I've put down, include all the information in your academic CV that does not. Now, when I say all the information, be selective. The additional information that you can put in, which awards have you received? And these should be based on your current level of experience. It is unfortunate that people do not clean up their CVs. They keep on adding to it. And I've seen CVs where people are rated researchers, but they still include, they matriculated uh, in certain year. That is no longer of any interest. If you've got a PhD, you must have matriculated. Are you a member of, in, <clears throat> also they, were, they would put the undergraduate achievements. You know, a, a senior lecturer or your associate professor, your undergraduate, or undergraduate and early experience that should start dropping away because you've already proven, you've got a proven track record at a certain level. So some of the older stuff can be excluded. Are you a member of a professional society? Now, there are people who are members of a lot of different societies. Again, be selective which ones you, can, you want to select. Have you acted as an external examiner for other institutions? Have you acted as a reviewer for journal articles? Now, th these may sound trivial and people quite often leave them out, but the reason they're important is that this is the evidence that your peers have got faith in the work that you are doing that they trust your knowledge and judgment and your objectivity. And they prepared on the basis of your experience and knowledge to send their students exams or um, thesis or dissertations to you uh, to review. So that is a trust that your peers have in you. And that is the evidence that we need to move forward. So are there any national or international collaborations? Have you conducted any international visits or study visits? Have you spent time abroad studying or training? As I said, all of these play a role in support of how you are viewed at the professional level by your peers. And then again, I keep on coming back to it and harping on it. Remember that you need to keep updating your CV and personal profile on a regular basis. What should you not include? And this is where younger researchers do run, run into problems. The personal information where you went to school and family background should be avoided. Personal interests such as hobbies and other activities should be avoided. And then this is not an application for a position in a company. This should reflect your research background. It is surprising how many people just copy and paste their research profile from the a CV, which obviously was sent out to industry or to a company uh, because they say, I'm, I'm a team player, I'm trustworthy, I'm hardworking. 
uh, and all the nice things, um, but they don't talk about their research. And that is what we should be concentrating on. Right, now we come to the business side of the session. The writing up of narratives. You've got to select your five best publications that you select in the last eight years, or from the last eight years. And that's why there's a focus with exclamation marks. From your combined list of research outputs in the past eight years, you identify and indicate no more than five outputs that you consider to be your best during the assessment period of 2015 to 2022. So how do you select this? Your older publications will have the highest citing number of sites. Your more recent publications, if you form a, follow the normal pattern, would be in higher impact journals than those that you published in eight years ago. And that is a balance that you have now got to decide. What, how do you balance between the impact factor versus the number of citations? And only you can decide on that. And that is where you feel the, the most impact, or the article with the most impact should be cited or should be within this, the file that you selected. Your best research outputs of students supervised in the last eight years. Now, this gives you an opportunity to give another couple of articles which you can use as a basis for um, your narratives later on. And, but you are required to provide the best research outputs of your students that you've supervised in the form of a narrative. And these are students who you should like to identify as having contributed to your core research during the period under review. So it's not just how many students you've supervised, and that they've all published. It must be those that you really feel you are proud of the work and that they have contributed to your core research. And this could be peer-reviewed publications, books or peer-reviewed journal articles, etc. And then you've got to include the full reference of the research contributions. It is not and unfortunately, <clears throat> a number of people do not read the, in, uh, if I can call it instructions, and they go off on a tangent by <clears throat> nominating saying, if this student of mine is now the managing director of this company. This student of mine is now a full professor at this university. And I've even had people who said, this student of mine is now the deputy general, uh, director general in this department. That is not what we're asking for. We are asking your outputs that contributed to your research. And all you need to do is include the full reference as you would with any list of references. No more, no less than that. Just a very short, this is what, this is a um, article, this is a reference, this was a contribution. So, <clears throat> we come to the next one. You've now got your five articles. You have got, some more articles from your students. And if you wish, you can put some outputs, your best research outputs prior to the last eight years. And this would really be those with a very high um, citation index. So <clears throat> you, there they ask you again, no more than 10 best publications with a brief motivation. 
And when they say den, it, they mean den. You don't have to go over, uh, uh, under den. You can, you're welcome to select less, but please do not go over den. So, brief description of completed research. It says, yeah, it's, it should be a succinct narrative of accomplished research, emphasizing only the research achievements over the last eight years, and with reference to the relevant research output listed for the last eight years, which must be provided. And within this, you can review your work and the progress of the findings, the citations, invitations, et cetera, can be included. This is also written or should be written in the first person. And unless you have got an ego like Donald Trump, it is very difficult to say, I did this, I did that. Not for him, but for most people. So my suggestion is that you frame it, your wording differently by saying this article addressed the following. This article um, was used as basis for something else. So you take the article and you make that the center of the narrative and not the I. Right. Then we come to the self-assessment of research outputs. Again, yeah, you need to talk about what, how do you see your work? Because it's a self-assessment. And you must provide an account of how these best research outputs reflect the development and growth of your research during the recent years. And bottom line is, what impact did your research have on process, procedure, and or policy? What impact did it have on the knowledge base of your discipline? How did you change, or how did this, these articles, or this specific article, change how people consider a, a research question? It may not be a research problem. It, it, quite often, the NRF uses the word research problem. It, it may not be a problem. It can be a philosophical question. But how did your work address some of these questions. And that is where, again, it is very difficult because the overlap between the completed research and then the self-assessment is not always that clear. And people, you must try and separate these and <clears throat> make sure that you do not duplicate um, and any of the previous work that you've mentioned. And there's the ongoing and future research. This is where you say, I, I'm going to continue with this work. The way to start off is saying the, the following papers are in press, are being uh, reviewed, I have been accepted, but not yet in press. That is your introduction because those papers that you have already sent out and have been accepted cannot be included in your normal publication list because the dates will automatically throw it out. So this is where you all those publications that you are busy with that you have submitted um, and I won't say planned because planned can be a very long-term thing but those that you know you've got the title you've got the journal that you've submitted it to um, and 
that is where you start. And then this is also the opportunity to say, from the research that I conducted during the past eight years, this specific field is being investigated further. And then you can say that is my ongoing research or my planned future research. I plan in future to move into a new direction. And then you can explain why and how it is you decided to do that. Um, and that will again form the basis in your next application for rating that you can fall back on by saying, this is, during this period, I moved into this. And that is why my publication, uh, number of publications within the specific focus area may not be as high as previously. Um, but it's because it is a new area. Then you have already got a reason for what you have uh, uh, planned and the route that you will be taking. Right. Something which happens right at the end of your <clears throat> application, they ask you for possible reviewers. And the, now we run into a problem. The call opens in September, normally. And normally it closes in January. When the call opens, it is recess, spring recess. Then it's exam time. Then all your colleagues start sending their manuscripts to you for marking and your students come in and they hand in their thesis and dissertations for you to mark and they all want it before the end of the year um, so that they can have a good break in December. And when you come back in January, the chaos of new students starts all over again and you're not immune to this you cannot lock yourself away and the reason i say now the the problem starts because you you've waited you've done all your work and now you've just got to quick quickly finish your application and now you get the possible reviewers and now <clears throat> you need to provide names and full contact details of six possible reviewers in order of priority who are best able to assess your recent research activities and contributions. And you need to nominate reviews from both South Africa and abroad, and preferably not from your own institution. So no colleagues and friends and family. Then you start looking for reviewers. And there's one specific review that you would like to nominate and you submit their name and the NRF comes back and says, it's not on our database. Uh, please put in the motivation and we will come back to you. But we are now approaching the deadline. This is why it is necessary even at this very early stage to start thinking about possible reviewers. Who can you approach? Where do you find your reviewers? And this to me is part of planning a conference attendance. Within the conference session that you are presenting your paper, that session has been specifically earmarked for this, your, your field of specialization. So everybody within that session should be presenting within your field and they should understand and know what you are presenting. So that's a good way to start. You also will find that during the session, you may have one or two people who come up with constructive ideas, even, I'll even call it constructive criticism, new ideas in the question and answer session. And afterwards, they 
and you can actually interact and find out more. Now that has got <clears throat> two benefits. People often when they apply for the KIC International Collaboration Program and they say, um, I'll, I'll be using it to network. And when you say to them, now explain to me exactly what you mean by networking, they can't. But this is a, a, the way you should be doing it. Your networking should now start by looking at who could be possible reviewers. And you may also identify somebody within that session who you do not want to have as a reviewer. Uh, and you'll always find somebody within a session which, um, if I can call it, is objectionable uh, in the way that they've question uh, and it's negative criticism instead of constructive um, and we've all come across them so this is a time when you start thinking about it and you reflect on it and all these narratives that i've been talking about you should start working on them now and give you time to reflect have you have you duplicated some of the work? Have you justified the way you presented your work? Or are you not doing justice? And often that it comes out when you start looking back, you, you write the <clears throat> narrative, don't worry about it being limited to 11,000 or 5,500 characters with spaces. Just write it down in a Word document, put it away and come back to it in a month's time. And now you have got time to look at it, to reflect on it and to co complete it. And now you can start editing and bringing it down to the number of characters. But if you get your way, until the call opens with all the other administrative duties that you have, you will be running into serious problems of time constraints. And this year, the date of, was extended to February um, and that was partly due to the COVID problems we had. Um, but in, in the past, the NRF closing date was fixed and you could not ask for an extension. Then take into consideration the administration that the institution has got to go through before they can submit your application. So there's an internal deadline and the internal deadline allows the institution to get all the applications for rating to be reviewed by different committees within the faculties, the research committees within the faculties, who can then come and give you feedback on your application, make suggestions on how it can be improved, things that they, they feel that's not clear, things that, and you are not there to defend your piece of paper. The, the reviewers and the committee, all they have in front of them would be the piece of paper that you have submitted and you cannot go in and defend it. And if they say to you, it is unclear, then there's a reason for that and then take note of that. So I urge you to sort of start, if you're serious about applying this year, start thinking about it. If, there, if you have any specific questions on it, you're welcome to contact me. Now the specialist committees have been retained, and you can see from 2018, um, there are 22 specialist committees the, the list is available of which are the committees. And then there's a publication where, uh, 
called the key research areas and types of research outputs. And these will give you an indication per discipline on what is required. And you find in the social sciences, there's a heavy emphasis on first author or single author publications. Whereas in the natural sciences and engineering, it is seldom that you will find a single author publication. So there, there are different ways that the different committees um, review these and you can familiarize, familiarize yourself with the requirements so that you know what is expected of you when submitting the public the um, application. And then finally, this is something that appeared quite a while ago, I think about 20 years ago, and there's some of his 10 lessons from the future is in the book of Wolfgang Grilke, um, actually highlighted issues around tertiary education, which now becoming more and more evident. But what I do like is that he says that you are destined to spend most of the rest of your life in the future. And you need to start planning now because what you are doing now, you are going into a, a five year planning cycle. So you need to understand that by delaying it, if it's not necessary, uh, you are delaying your own future uh, and it is rolling and becoming more extended during your delays. And on that, Andrew, back to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Freddie. You can now uh, discontinue the, the sharing button, or even if you leave it on the screen, uh, for your very clear presentation. Uh, and I hope that the participants will have uh, several questions and or comments to, to make. Um, and uh, uh, let's start off. I saw a commentary or just a chat from uh, Zaid Wakit uh, in the Martha also, uh, you know, concurred with the same question. The question that Zaid that was, uh, if you have an article, if you are already a rated researcher, the last five years, but you had an article that is still within the eight years. Could you use this? Could you indicate the same article as one of the uh, articles that uh, are considered useful in the rating within the rating period? Yes. I, I have no problem. If, if that article, if you have submitted that article previously in, in yeah. a rating application, but that was in the last, let's say three years. Yeah. And it now falls in the eight year period. I will still, because the impact of that article um, may have increased because of the number of citations. Absolutely. So there is no reason why you cannot um, submit the same article. Other comments, questions? If you have a question, please. Uh... You can just raise your hand, or if I can't see you, I've got your names here. If uh, I see, you can raise your hand or just uh, introduce yourself and ask a question. Uh, while you are thinking about it, I think one of the, the most important things, and I know that you had another side of or another. Uh, side of the, the rating system that uh, Stellan Como did uh, present. Uh, but again, I think one of the important things that uh, uh, Fedi has raised is, of course, preparation. Uh, preparing to wait for, you know, don't wait until opening of the system. Some of these you can actually start off and use your own web documents and uh, prepare. So that when it comes, when the system is open, you simply then uh, can, especially the CV add to, to that. Um, the other question from Martha Bradley again is, would a monograph be considered a single publication? Uh, I'm, you know, ambitiously asking. Um, 
Betty, can you respond to that? And then I'll probably make a contribution. Um, I would believe a holograph would a be a single con a monograph. A monograph. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, monograph. No, mm -hmm. most most cases. Some of the sorry, I've misheard you. When um, most of the disciplines do not accept a monograph as um, a peer-reviewed publication. It does not got this. It does not have the same uh, status. Now I'm I'm being very selective here because some um some disciplines accept it yeah others do not some disciplines accept the fish shrift others do not um so it's very that is why you need to go to the key research areas and see what the key research areas uh indicate that they accept and what they don't accept yeah in fact uh, uh, martha has then you know, clarified and specifically in law, which I believe does because of the law reports and stuff. But again, uh, Fedi, you want to, uh, I think what Fedi has given is, of course, the important part is that the NRF publishes the acceptable or the document that we indicate to what is considered to, re to be research outputs in a given particular specialist group. So. Um, again, it's a question of just looking at those, and I would imagine uh, areas like history uh, and law, of course, those consider books, uh, and they would indicate if the monographs are actually peer-reviewed. But uh, uh, any further comment on that, uh, Fedi? No, I think I, 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 I'm going to get into trouble here, because I try to say to uh, researchers, especially in the natural sciences, stay mm. away from books. Mm. And the reason for that is simply the amount of time spent on a book does not warrant the number of publications that you could have produced, number one. Number two, the subsidy for the book uh, and versus the number of articles that you could have produced are not the same and it is and i, I ask people have you ever cited an a, a article from a book or something quoted something from a book and the response has been in 90 percent of the cases never because it's by the time the book is published it is history and therefore I'm working with current articles, so it's 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 an interpretation of your discipline Absolutely. that will decide for you, book or no book. Um, but in in general, I'm very. I won't say anti books. Um, the only reason is that it, it takes a tremendous amount of time, and you do not always get the support of the publishers for you to be able to claim DHET um, accreditation or, or the, the peer review. But, but uh, you know, as you rightly indicated, of course, uh, it is also very. Uh, discipline based, especially in the sciences, that is uh, critical. If you look at the, for instance, computer sciences, they don't even spend time to wait for the journal articles. That's why conference proceedings and or, uh, indicators are there. But when you come to areas like history, uh, law, those are very critical. That's the nature of the business. That's the nature of the beast. Uh, to give you an example of uh, one very interesting experience uh, that I've had in the NRF is with a person like uh, um, uh, Charles Van Osselen. Yeah. Uh, and, his book. Book, uh, <laughs> and his book, and in fact, at some point, Charles Van Osselen, his uh, A rating uh, lapsed and he decided not to apply at that particular time because he was in the middle of writing another very uh, you know, seminal book and which he did. And it didn't take a year or two in terms of its actual impact within the history field around the world 
to actually just think that he continued to exist as uh, the leader in his field. Yeah. So in essence, what we simply are saying is that you must be very clear and go and check the list of uh, in each particular area that you're working with, what are the acceptable you know, um, uh, you know, uh, publications uh, for research and, uh, and how they are dealt with. Uh, of course, you will recall, and or some of you are aware that the Department of Higher Education uh, and, and Training, especially in terms of subsidies, had to rework the subsidy rating for the book. Uh, with the, you know, uh, the, the uh, I was privileged to work with the givers. Uh, then Professor Givers guided the process with the ASAF to actually produce that. But again, it's not massive. But the nature of the beast for those who work with books, that's essentially what it, what it is. So it's a matter of which area that you're working. Yeah. Any I think other? It's, yeah, go, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it is very discipline specific. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that's why I said I get into trouble when I say to people, but normally I, it's with the scientists and the engineers where yeah. I, uh, I, I talk to them. Um, I will not ventured the same argument in theology, uh, history, philosophy, and I can name quite a lot, um, because there it is part of the, the key, uh, the core business uh, of those disciplines. Hmm. I see a hand by Everett uh, Weber. Everett? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I think we must be careful I think the problem is the relationship between the social sciences and the humanities and Absolutely. the natural sciences. Yeah. Uh, these two different fields of human endeavor have developed different traditions. And the place and status of the article published in a journal is very, it's, it's, it's different in the humanities. And I'm, I'm very pleased, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you mentioned the example of Charles Van Onsen. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, 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 people said, and at that time, um, he was an A-rated scientist. Mm. And uh, 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 I remember colleagues saying, He's read, written very, very few articles. The books, the status and place of the book in the humanities and social sciences has been absolutely critical, no matter how long it takes. And there are scholars, and I think in South Africa, uh, uh, Charles Van Onselen is an excellent example of somebody who spent several years not only write, producing a book and writing a book, but writing a book which makes a difference to the field. Yeah, you, you and have you, you, you so have that in, and, and he of course works in history. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, um, so um, and in my own field in international and comparative education, hmm. the contribution made by scholars over the years, if I think over the past fifty to sixty years of scholars uh, in that field who've written books uh, has been absolutely critical. And also in the field of method, hmm. or method in social sciences. So we must be careful what we are comparing. Um, the, 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 uh, I, I sometimes think of this as, a, it's almost like a bit of saying that a novel is better than a poem. I mean, who's to say? Uh, poetry has its place, and uh, some people write short stories, and that has its place. And uh, but to say the one is better than the other, I think is 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 I I disagree with that point of view. Thank uh, you. No, I yeah yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Everett. But I think to uh, to Fadi's uh, defense, that's why he was cautious, and he says when you know when it comes to natural sciences and engineering. But even within engineering. That's why we are talking about computer sciences has also got its way. My main, you know, and our both, Freddie and I, our advice is please ensure that you go to the NRF website. There is a 22 panels 
And each one of those has even got an indication of what are they considered up to each particular category. They indicate what are they considered research outputs in there. The one thing that you must all avoid is textbooks, just like in the Department of uh, uh, you know, Higher Education subsidies, textbooks are not uh, considered at all. So absolutely right, Everett. And the point is that for certain fields, um, the book, maybe they, they, you know, is, not just maybe, is in fact the, the principal uh, research output. And that is why, uh, as I said, that's the nature of the beast. While others are producing, like those in biotechnology can produce, you know, 20 articles in a year or whatever the case may be. Whereas to write one particular, uh, you know, uh, full book, is, you know, may take a little, a, a while because of the nature of the, the you know, the, 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 the field. And I think just to also highlight the same problem, fairly referred to, for instance, when you look at the, the H index as uh, part of the supporting information. There's always a worry, uh, I think, amongst uh, many people with the rating system and say, oh no, the NRF is going to be using the H, you know, H index and it's very unfair in certain fields. There is a recognition that certain fields, like Fedi indicated, the H index may be very low. To give you another example of my, you know, my experience in the NRF, in the early days and people using H index, one of the very highest ranking or rated social scientist, uh, communication person was Kia Tomaselli. Uh, Kian, uh, his H index was very minimal. Why? And if you said, oh, but Kian Tomaselli's uh, H index is so low when you compare to the others because his field uh, just did not, you know, become one of those that uh, in fact uh, uh, would be, you know, the H index applied to uh, significant because of the, you know, the indexing system within that particular process. So we are always mindful of these particular processes and we always, you know, uh, are very grateful, especially for you as researchers in your own field to raise these particular issues in order for us to make sure that uh, the assessment and the fairness of the system is actually within disciplines rather than trying to compare apples with oranges. We know that we're talking about impact. We know we're talking about research outputs, but Tom, you know, that uh, Charles von Oslin, one book may be one book that has impact not only on South Africa, but around the world. And I remember one of the reviewers, as I sat on the executive evaluation committee, uh, one of the reviewers, one of the report indicated and said, if anybody were to do the history of anything in this particular area. The seminal doc that you cannot do without is Charles Van Ossie. And this person was not in South Africa, but in fact in the United States. And, and so that's a kind of thing that you want to be sure that particular fields will have to be assessed differently uh, within the same process. That and Any other and questions? If I can just comments? add to that. <clears throat> sure. Within the panels, those panels are more or less discipline specific, mm -hmm. and they understand where you are coming from. And that is why that, that key research area document is so critical, because there they explain exactly what they're looking at. You, you are presenting it to your peers, and they will know that the H index in our field is very low. Whereas if, if somebody comes in biotechnology and they say they've got an H index of X, the people might turn around and say, but that's very low. Whereas somebody else would turn around and say, that's fantastic, um, but it's meaningless. So it is, and, the, you, and this is where the peer review from outside, as well as the panels and the assessor comes into play because they understand the discipline. They understand um, the background to this, and therefore you are not being disadvantaged by having people who have got a different perspective. Thank, thank you very much for that. Any other comments, uh, questions? Uh, 
talk with Zami. No, oh, thank you very much for the wonderful session. It 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 has helped me a lot. No, but the, there's a question that I want to ask. That uh, uh, it's something that I've heard from one of my colleagues mm -hmm. who got the, the 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 Y rating. I think it was last year. Yeah. I wanted to know for the rating, uh, do you get the money, the funding, once? Is it a once-off thing? Mm. And another thing, another question that I, I have, this colleague of mine has Tutuga funding mm. and he was told that the Tutuga funding will be cut off since he has, he has found the, 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 the rating. Is, is that true? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Fadi, do you want me to respond to that or you want to take it on? No, no uh, you can respond, but uh, um, let's not confuse rating and funding. Hmm. In, uh, in the previous system, the, uh, when I say previous system, the, in the old NRF, um, there was a link between the funding and your rating. That was discontinued. And what happened is that there is now a competitive program for unrated research and a competitive program for rated researchers that you can apply for funding. But for the Y rated researchers, they get the once off, um, they can apply for a once off grant um, to set themselves up to, to do the rating, uh, mm -hmm. sort of to get the better rating within the five year period. Now, with the Tatuka grant and the Y rating, what happens is that you, you are entitled to complete your Tatuka period yes. um, before you can get the Y rated grant, but yes. they will not take it away. The whole idea of the grant is that you have been given it for three years, and after three years, if you did get the rating, a Y rating, um, you, you will then be, you will then qualify to apply for the 300,000 Rand Young Researcher Grant. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because I need to just come back. Uh, the Firstly, the, the Tutuka has got three tracks. Tutuka has got a track which is for people who are completing their, their PhD or to facilitate them to complete the PhD. So one could uh, be given the Tutuka grant in order to finish the PhD. And once they have completed the PhD, somebody can also apply for the Tutuka grant, which is like a postdoc to assist them to work within the three years. Again, have a, a grant that helps them to accumulate the research outputs and work around those particular research outputs. That is another part of the Tutuka that one can, you know, can apply for. Then there's a third part of it which is a, you know, the rating track. And again, that provides for the three years. So in essence, somebody can get to Tuka if they are doing well for nine years. However, if one is in the tracking, in, in the Tutuka, in the Tutuka rating track, and they get rated, let's say in the second year of their third year of grant, as Fedi has indicated, there is no way that the NRF would just cut off and say, oh, just because you've got the Y rating, we are cutting from. It has to complete. It will end at the end of this, the, the three years that ends. You know? um, the other part of what the rating does, and we have what we call the incentive funding for, you know, in terms of not the, the competitive funding for rated researchers, but an incentive funding. If a person is rated for the first time, they get an incentive funding. Unfortunately, of course, at the beginning, when we reintroduced some funding that was there, we were providing incentive funding for the period of the rating. Uh, funding became difficult. Funding became, you know, uh, few, you know, fewer and fewer, less and less. So a few years ago, the NRF then uh, dropped that particular part of funding everybody for the period of the rating, which is for five years. So the incentive funding, it's a small amount of funds, 
for Y-rated researchers, they'll get about 40,000 per year. The uh, C-rated researchers, uh, 40,000 in that particular part. And it can be used for anything that is you know, work, you know, research related or for you to work with the student or whatever the case may be. But that's a once of uh, funding that is, uh, that is there uh, because of the, that particular. But the point your colleague indicated, if the person has the Tutuka funding, it will have to then be completed in order for it, it won't be renewed because of the fact that the person has actually completed. I see Savelo has got a question. Um, I, you know, I guess that there are also many uh, intangible things. Uh, Sabelo, would you like to, to ask the question that uh, I, I can't see from here what you are trying to ask uh, more specifically? I was just checking if like, uh, say other things like, because you know, in some professions, people yeah. would be, would do interviews, whether it's radio yeah. or TV, and, and, and that's based actually on their research and stuff. So yeah. does that count in an NRF rating or it's not, not related? It, it's very difficult to, to, I mean, again, remember, as Fedi was saying, and I'll probably let Fedi ask that answer, the rating depends on research outputs and its impact. Um, now, if you were to say that you have conducted research and one of the key areas that you have actually worked on continues to be used as part of uh, community engagement and you spend time, in fact, in relating how the, you know, your research has changed people's uh, direction and it goes on radio and whatever, it may well be some of the description that one would describe and say, in fact, the work that I've done, this is how it has been worked around. But using radio and interviews and so on as a basis for research output is not, you know, uh, in many instances considered as research output, but perhaps as an extension of how useful uh, how impactful the research has become. Uh, Fedi, you have any other opinions about that? No, I, th I fully agree with you. But I, I would like to mention on that, the impact that Farmers Weekly has yeah. on the farming community is huge. And if you have written a academic article for whichever peer-reviewed journal. And all of a sudden, Farmers Weekly pick up on this and they then come and interview you. That is an impact that it, it is, it, it, Farmers Weekly is not a peer-reviewed journal. It is, um, yeah, but the impact it has is huge within that community. And therefore that would, form part of the evidence of the impact your work has had mm -hmm. that Farmers Weekly came and interviewed you on, because of your findings in whatever area it is. And, and really that you need to look at its specifics rather than in general terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Tokozani, I see your comment about your friend uh, who must have completed the PhD and then was looking at trying to apply for a second, or thinking about applying for the second round of the PA, you know, of the rating, you know, track uh, in terms of uh, if a person then has got a Y rating because they've completed the, you know, it, it becomes even easier. Fair dimension, we have the NRF has got uh, the Y rated development grant, which is even a much more concentrated part for the Y-rated researcher. So what they've tried to do is essentially not to, to punish people who get the Y rating. There's also another grant that is available, um, which again can actually be used instead of a, a person who has a, a, a Tutuka grant, who completes a Tutuka grant, and then he's, he or she is rated, gets a Y rating. You can then apply for the Y-rated researchers grant because that is intended to assist you uh, to produce more publications, more work 
in order for you perhaps after a period of time to actually come back and submit your particular work for, for rating. So it's it's not the job, double jeopardy to say, oh, it's a disadvantage, I've now got a Y rating, I won't be able to apply for the Y rating, the, the truck for the uh, for the rating truck because I've got a Y rating. There is another grant which uh, uh, which is available in the United States. Is that helpful, Tokozani? Yes, thank, thank you very much. You're most welcome. Any other comments or questions? It's now just uh, close to half past four. We don't necessarily have to stay until five o'clock. Uh, if uh, your questions have been answered and or you uh, you know, uh, Fendi gave himself that you could contact him. Uh, you can contact uh, other people like Stella and Como, who also gave the same kind of uh, description. I am also available on the side as a, a person who has uh, been involved in the rating system. Uh, the idea for the you know, you know for this particular process is to assist you, to assist your process of uh, submitting for rating system. My encouragement to you, and as Fedi has indicated, is take time. Look at the NRF system uh, and acquaint yourself with what is happening in addition to the presentations that have been. Importantly, please ensure that you update your CV in readiness for the, uh, for the, uh, for the system to open uh, in September uh, when it does open, uh, you know, um, um, you know the, 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 when they open the, the rating system. So please, you know, take time to just uh, get an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to acquaint yourself, uh, especially in the finding what, you know, what kind of specialist committee are you going to be looking at and, uh, or as, you know, requesting yourself to be looked at in terms of the evaluation. That way then you also, the key research outputs for the particular area so that you are very clear about it. Please, if you can ensure that you do a short evaluation, uh, Megan has already sent to everybody, it will be most grateful if you can do, do the evaluation. Uh, it will help us and it will help Fedi and it will help all of us who are engaged in this particular process to improve and or add more information that will assist you. Um, uh, on that score, unless there are any other uh, comments, Megan, do you have any uh, inputs or any comments, uh, Fedi, anything uh, in the, you know, uh, the final word? I don't know if Kate eventually joined us. She was in another meeting, but uh, perhaps I'll stop there. If there is any uh, comments from anybody before we uh, uh, call it a day and adjourn. No, from just my thank side. you all for a fantastic session. Thank you very much, Akhet. Good to see you. <laughs> but just to remind everyone to continue to pursue research for the knowledge. <laughs> for the, we fully understand. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. sure Everard will give me a gold star for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Everard, oh. do I get a gold star? Oh. Everard, you muted. And and uh, Aurelia has given you a big smile, so it's not <laughs> just Everard. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Fedi, thank you very very much for your presentation. And as uh, Kate has indicated, uh, it's essentially. You know, these all things come together because the idea is for us to advance our various areas of knowledge. And, uh, and of course, we, you know, consequences of getting, you know, the subsidies, consequences of getting the rating is just the cherry on the top. So thank you very much and you'll have a good day, all of you. Andrew, from my side, thank you very much for moderating this and uh, look forward to meeting you again. Thank you very much, my friend. You take care. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.